Chapter 11 of The Mystery of the Chinese Ring by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 Inside China. Biff placed a hand on his friend's arm. Why, Chuba was trembling. The realization of Chuba's fear of the border patrol was startling to Biff. Chuba showed no such fear in the jungle. He wasn't afraid of crocodiles, snakes, or tigers. He respected them as man's natural enemies. But now, confronted with the border guard, Chuba was near panic. Biff thought back to Chuba's talk about how easy it was to cross the border, how he said he'd crossed several times. When they were discussing this dangerous trip, Chuba had practically brushed the guards aside as no problem. But the fear must have been there just the same. Chuba was a good actor. Biff realized just how much courage it must have taken on Chuba's part to agree to guide him into China. He gripped the native boy's arm in friendship and to reassure him. Take it easy, Chuba. We're all right. But let's cut back down the trail and figure out what we can do. Biff flashed a smile at Chuba and signaled the direction he meant to take. Chuba followed close on his heels like a puppy. After retracing their steps for about 100 yards down the path, the boys ducked off the trail and found a hiding place behind a thick clump of bushes. For a few moments, Biff talked quietly. He talked about Indianapolis, his home, about the United States. He talked about anything that came into his head. He wanted to calm Chuba down. American talk, he thought, would do the trick since it was Chuba's favourite subject. Soon a weak smile came over Chuba's face. I'm sorry, Biff, he apologized. I'm sorry I act like chicken. That's okay, Chuba. I'd have been scared too, if I knew as much about the border guard as you do. I hear many things, all bad. Tell me honestly, Chuba, you said you've crossed the border several times. Have you really? Yes, Biff, Chuba, not lie. Only, he paused, Never any border guard round when Chuba slip over before. I see. Well, what do we do about it? You think the guard will stay there all day? Can't tell. Much likely they will stay long time. I suppose so, Biff said. He thought a minute. It might be that there's been a lot of slipping across the border here lately, and these guards have been assigned to stop it. I think you right, Biff. Neither spoke for several minutes. Both were trying to figure a way out of the spot they found themselves in. How about this, Chuba? Couldn't we either go up the river a couple of hundred yards or more, or down the river and slip across? Chuba shook his head. No, Biff, river narrow, run very quick on both sides of the clearing. Too deep. Jungle grow real thick and fierce right to water's edge. Can't get through. Well, we've just got to get across somehow. We're losing time. As Biff spoke, another thought was building in his head. Now let me ask you this, Chuba. See if you think this plan might work. Supposing I cut off the trail about a hundred feet from the clearing. I'll make my way through the underbrush to a spot, say, seventy-five feet away from the trail. You go hide behind that tree where we first spotted the guard. You follow me? Okay, so far. Right, then I'll yell like a Comanche. That ought to distract the guard. They'll try to find who's making the noise. If they leave the clearing, you can slip across the river. Good idea, Biff, but how about you? How are you going to get across? Same way. Only this time you do the distracting. You yell like a Comanche. Chuba grinned. Could work. But how does Comanche bird yell? Biff decided to postpone his lecture on TV Westerns until another time. Don't worry about it. Just yell like I do. We've got to try it. It's our only chance. Now, if you get across all right, wait. Wait a good long time. By then the guards will probably give up the search and return to their post in the clearing. I don't imagine they like prowling around the jungle too much. No, too many wild animals. OK, so you'd better make your way a good distance from the clearing. Say you go to a place about a hundred yards opposite the river, down river, so I'll know where to listen for you. You're going to be on the same side as the guards, so be sure you're in a safe place 
and can make a fast getaway if they should come anywhere near you. Don't worry about that. Chuba can hide good in jungle. All right, let's get moving. But neither moved for a few minutes. Both boys were reluctant to part company. They knew the danger lying before them. They might never see one another again if Biff's plan failed. Now, where will we meet? Biff asked. You just keep running down path after you cross river. Get as far as you can, then find good hiding place. When I know the guard has gone back to clearing, I'll move along trail making sound like a crow, like this. Chuba let out a soft caw caw. It was an exact imitation. Chuba wouldn't have any trouble being a Comanche bird either, Biff thought. Good, I'm off. Biff pushed his way into the underbrush. It was tough going. The low, dense vegetation tore at him. Vines dropped like heavy curtains from the tall trees, hiding whatever lay ahead. It was steaming hot. Biff wrestled the jungle growth, sweat streaming down his face and body. It must have taken him nearly half an hour to penetrate a distance of about seventy-five to a hundred feet. Chuba could hear Biff making his way through the bush. At first he didn't move. He knew he had to go back to the clearing, but the thought was frightening. It took all his courage to force himself back up the path. But he knew that if he didn't, he would let his friend down. Biff's plan depended on Chuba being at the clearing at the right moment. Yet if the plan misfired, Chuba shuddered. Back at the edge of the clearing, Chuba crawled on his stomach to where the low growth stopped. Carefully he parted the bush he lay behind. The peephole allowed him a full view of the clearing. They were still there. The two guards squatted on their haunches. One was munching some food. The other braced himself by holding on to the barrel of his submachine gun, the gun's butt resting on the ground. Chuba inched backward. He took up his position behind the tree. Biff's yelling could come any moment now. What would the guards do? Would they come charging across the stream to do their searching? Chuba didn't think so. If they did, then they would be crossing the border illegally, although Chuba knew that often the guards paid scant attention to this regulation. What if only one guard took up the search, the other remaining behind to guard the clearing? One good thing, Chuba knew, was that from the direction Biff had taken, it might appear that the yelling came from the same side of the river that the guards were on. There was a sharp turn in the stream about thirty feet to the west of the clearing. If Biff made his way towards the river bank, he might actually be behind the guards, but still on the side opposite from them. Eee, ah, the sharp, piercing scream rose above the constant chattering of the monkeys, the shrill calls of jungle birds. For a moment the jungle became silent. The monkeys and birds were as startled as the two guards. So that was American bird yell. Much wow, Chuba was impressed. Chuba, moving slightly forward, saw the guards leap to their feet. They looked about them quickly. Both released the safety catches on their weapons. They raised their guns to firing position. Eowie! Again the wild cry blasted through the jungle. The guards turned in the direction the cry came from. Yow, 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 yow! The series of short cries came in rapid succession. The jungle had never heard a sound like it. It could only come from a human being. One of the guards motioned in the direction of the cries. Then he started towards the spot. The other guard held back until his companion turned and spoke to him in an angry voice. The two plunged into the undergrowth. Now was his chance. With his heart pounding, fear tightening his throat muscles, Chuba made his dash. He was in midstream when once more Biff let out a series of short cries, followed by a long eeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeee
waiting for Chuba to take over his part in the action. Chuba moved along the path back towards the river. He moved cautiously, silently, making no more noise than a big cat stalking its prey. When he neared the clearing, Chuba went down to his hands and knees. Taking advantage of the cover offered by the low bushes, he crept forward. Again carefully parting a heavy bush, he looked into the clearing. The guards had returned. They were talking rapidly to one another. Chuba couldn't make out their words, but he felt sure they were talking about the strange cry they had heard. They were probably frightened by it, and at this thought Chuba smiled. He felt a lot better now. He had made it over the border. But even as he had this thought, he remembered Biff. Biff had to get across. Only half the job was done. Biff would surely be back at the tree by now. Time for more action. A frown of doubt crossed Chuba's face. Would the guard be fooled a second time? Chuba went ahead with the plan. He walked back up the trail for one hundred paces. Then he slithered into the underbrush crawling, forcing his way through the wall of thick, spiny growth. If he, Chuba, made the same kind of noise Biff had made, wouldn't the guards' suspicions be aroused? Already they would be tense, nervous. They hadn't found anything the first time. Wouldn't they just ignore a second set of strained yows and eowies? Chuba felt sure they would. So what could he do? He just had to help Biff cross. Okay, he knew what he would do. He could outsmart the guard in the denseness of the jungle. They would never be able to catch him. Chuba reached a position he thought would do. It was near the spot he and Biff had discussed, as far as he could figure. He took a deep breath, then shouting in Chinese, he called out, Help! Help! Strange man here! Strange man! Help! Help! He waited. Moments passed. He repeated his call for help. Seconds later, he heard the crashing of the guards as they fought through the underbrush. Chuba waited no longer. He got himself away from the spot where he had called out as fast as he could wriggle his body along. He knew he had made a safe getaway when he could no longer hear the guards struggling against the brush. Chuba smiled to himself. He knew he was only about fifty feet from the trail. He sat down. He would wait, a long wait this time, to make sure the guard had gotten back to the clearing, and that Biff had plenty of time to put a good distance between himself and the river. Chuba leaned back against the base of a tree. He felt good about the way things had gone. Suddenly the noises of the jungle were drowned out by the most horrible noise of all, the angry bup, bup, bup of a submachine gun's fire. First there was a short burst, another short burst. This was followed by a longer burst as several rounds were fired. Then silence. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of the Mystery of the Chinese Ring by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve Shooting the Yangtze Rapids. Eerie silence spread over the jungle following the machine gun firing. The jungle was holding its breath. The monkeys, birds, even the cicadas stopped their endless chattering and calling for several moments. Chuba sat rigid, his fists clenched, as fear tore at his nerves. Biff! What had happened to his friend Biff? What could he do? What was there to do? The question whirled in his head. No sensible answers came. If he went back down the trail toward the river, he might run into the guards, still prowling, ready to let loose their deadly spray of bullets at the slightest strange sound or movement. But what about Biff? Had those shots been directed at him, and had they reached him? Chuba shuddered at the thought. After waiting as long as his worried mind would permit him, Chuba decided to investigate. On his stomach he wormed his way toward the path. At the edge of the brush he stopped. For minutes he lay still, listening, listening, straining his ears to catch any sound that might warn him of the guard's presence. It's all right, he told himself, trying desperately to rebuild his courage. They've gone back to the clearing. It's safe for me to explore. Just as Chubbish snaked his body halfway out of the trail, he tensed. He heard a noise behind him. 
Not much of a noise, only the faintest rustle in the brush. Quickly the native boy worked his way backward off the trail. Again he heard the noise, slightly louder this time. An animal, a snake. Chuba knew that his knife, long and sharp as it was, would be little protection against a jungle animal, and even less against guards armed with rapid-fire weapons. Then he caught another faint sound, soft, so soft as to be barely heard. Yow, yow, ee. Silence, then slightly louder. Yow, yow. Chuba's face brightened. Cool, cool, he answered. Chuba was the one word whispered in reply to his crow call. The native boy wiped his forehead with his forearm and sighed in relief. It was Biff. It had to be. Biff was all right. Biff? Chuba called in a squeaky voice. The boy scrambled to the edge of the trail again. He looked carefully to his right, down the trail towards the river. Then he looked left, where the Comanche call had been sounded. He saw Biff's stained face poke out of the bushes about ten feet away. A big grin showed white teeth even whiter against his brown face. The two boys wasted no time in talk. They made tracks and fast away from the river, away from the border guard. After an hour of steady travelling, Chuba darted off the main path, following a little used one deep into the bush. We rest here, Chuba said, gasping for breath. Okay by me, said Biff. It seemed to him that every bone, every muscle in his body ached. The struggle through the jungle growth, the tension of making the river crossing, had worn both boys out. Both were only too happy to stretch out and let their bodies regain strength. So this is China, Biff said wearily. He sat up, dug into his bundle, and took out a small bottle of antiseptic. This he rubbed over the scratches on his legs and arms. He handed the bottle to Chuba. Then he took out a large tube of insect repellent. Flies and mosquitoes had formed a small cloud around the two. What happened? Chuba asked. I heard much gun shoots. I worry. I think maybe they shoot Biff. They tried to, Chuba. I fooled him, though. How you do this? Well, I got across the river all right without being seen. Those guards really jumped when they heard you call. I'd gone maybe fifty feet down the trail on this side when I heard the guards coming back out of the brush, back to the trail, so I dived into a thicket and crawled away from the trail. I don't know how long I waited. Then I heard the guards getting nearer the spot where I was hiding. They almost find you. Darn near it. I don't believe they could have been more than ten feet from me at one time. That's when I figured I had to do something. I found a stick about three feet long and as thick as your arm. I heard the guards talking to one another. Then I hurtled the stick as far as I could. It crashed in the brush, made quite a noise. Just what I wanted. The guards rushed back down the trail towards the spot where the stick landed. Then they opened up. That's the shooting you heard. Chuba smiled. I bet they cut big hole in underbrush with those bullets. But we fooled them, Chuba. We got across. Now we better get moving again, the boy was suddenly very businesslike. Not far from here is small village. When we get there, we take main road. Now we're inside China, no more have to take to secret trails and paths. We're just two Chinese beggar boys. By nightfall, the boys had reached the crumbling grey wall surrounding a small village. In this village, said Chuba, lives the young brother of my father. He will give us shelter for the night. The boys passed through the village gate. Biff saw a small rust-stained cannon seemingly hanging down from the wall on one side of the gate. At the other side, another cannon lay in the dirt at the base of the wall. It had long since broken away from its emplacement. Once, many years ago, these cannon protected the village from the raids of bandits. But now the wall was crumbling in many places, and the city was open to anyone wishing to enter. Biff and Chuba made their way along a narrow dirt street, lined with small houses made of thatch and mud. Men, women and children, all poorly dressed, moved back and forth, at times filling the street until it was difficult for the boys to make their way. They reached the end of the street, a distance of not much more than a quarter of a mile. Chuba cut off to his left towards a house standing just inside the grey wall, but somewhat removed from the other houses. The house of my uncle, Chuba said, pointing. 
Biff was glad to leave the street. It was littered with trash, and the smells were sickening. When we are inside the house of my uncle, you must not say a single word, Chuba warned. I do not want even him to know you are America, boy. I tell him you can hear but cannot talk. I tell him we on our way to visit the older brother of my father, he who lives on the banks of the Yangtze River. The house was roughly made of earthen bricks and thatched with wheat straw. A small man stood at the entrance to the house. The doorway was closed only by a drooping cloth, sewn together from several grain bags. Chuba bowed low as he approached his uncle. They spoke together rapidly. Biff, of course, could not understand a single word spoken. Chuba turned to him. My uncle welcomes us. He says we may sleep here and he will feed us. Come, we go in. The floor of the house was earth, worn smooth and packed hard by the feet of three generations of the uncle's family. A Chinese woman looked at the boys as they entered, but spoke no word of greeting. She was the uncle's wife. Two children, each younger and smaller than Chuba, stared at the boys, their eyes round with wonder at seeing strangers. Chuba's uncle spoke to his wife. Minutes later she brought both the boys a small portion of rice, served in an earthen saucer. The rice had little or no flavour for Biff, but it was hot and he ate every grain. Night had fallen. The only light came from the fire in the open oven set in one wall of the house. The uncle spoke again to Chuba, and the boy nodded and motioned Biff to follow. The uncle took them into a small room which was to be their sleeping room. There were only three rooms in the house. Biff looked about him. The room was bare except for one low bench standing in the centre. They would sleep that night on the dirt floor, and sleep they did, as if they were in the most comfortable beds ever made. At dawn, with another small bowl of rice to warm their stomachs, the boys were on their way again. The boys crossed the plateau of Yunnan and reached Cheik Chiang on the Yangtze River. This was the small town where the older brother of Chuba's father lived. From this uncle, Chuba borrowed a crudely built small boat, held together with wire and wooden pegs. Two cumbersome, double-bladed oars would be the power. The boat was to be left at San Hiango, a village about 100 miles west of Chungking. Chuba's uncle would get it on his next trip to the large city. The Yangtze River, rising out of the mountains of Tibet on its 3,500-mile course to the Yellow Sea, flows swiftly in the western part of China. The ugly yellow water roars through chasms, with lofty crags on either side rising 300 feet high. The little boat, Biff in the bow, Chuba in the stern, raced along like a small chip of wood. It was fun at first, after the tiring days of fighting their way through the jungle on foot. They sped through gorges, putting mile after mile behind them. As they neared San Hiango, the river widened. Boiling white water told Biff that they were getting into shallower water. A roar from ahead told him they were approaching rapids. They shot the first three rapids without trouble, then entered a broad, smooth stretch of water where they drifted slowly with the current. Rounding a sharp bend, Biff again heard the roar of white water. This time the roar was louder than before. The small craft suddenly picked up speed. The boat plunged into the swirling, dashing water and was tossed about as if it were a twig. Time and again it seemed the boat would crash on a huge boulder. Each time the current swirled it around just in time to prevent a smash-up. Looking ahead, Biff could see the end of the rapid. The round swell of the water was a warning. Falls ahead. There must be a drop of several feet, Biff figured. He couldn't see directly beyond the falls. All that was visible was a broad body of water beyond, smooth, quiet, wide enough to be a small lake. There was nothing to do but pray that the boat would get safely over the falls and into the calm water beyond. Hold on, Chuba, Biff called. Oars were useless now. The boat was caught up in a natural spillway, a narrow, fast-moving path of water which shot over the falls and plunged downward. The boat shot over the spillway. For moments it seemed to hang in mid-air, then it hit the water below with a bone-jarring smack. We made it, Biff cried jubilantly, turning to look back at Chuba. Chuba had disappeared. 
He had been thrown out of the boat as it leapt over the falls. Biff spotted his friend's head in the water, twenty feet this side of the falls. Have a good swim, Chuba, Biff shouted gaily. I'll wait for you. Biff reset the oars and leaned them on his knees. Hey, Chom, not so much splash. Biff's happy call faded out. Chuba was floundering in the water. His arms stopped thrashing and his head went out of sight. Then it bobbed into view, only to sink a second time. With a start, Biff realized Chuba couldn't swim. End of chapter 12Chapter 13 of The Mystery of the Chinese Ring by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 The First Clue. Jack Hudson looked up from his desk as Muscles, the powerful mechanic, came in. For a few moments the two men stared at one another, saying nothing. Muscles, hands on hips, broad shoulders squared, chest thrust out, looked like an angry bull about to charge. OK, Muscles, let's have it, Jack said. About those kids, what are we going to do? I wish I knew. We've got to do something. You're darn tooting we have, Muscles bellowed. I'm sick and tired of just sitting around here waiting. We got to act. Take it easy, Muscles. I've been thinking about it as much as you have. Now look, Jack. Charlie Keene's been gone almost a month. The kid's nearly two weeks. I know, I know. But what can we do? You know what it means to go in after them. You think you know where they are? Jack nodded his head. I've got a pretty good idea where the boys are heading. I just hope Charlie's in the same general area. I just hope they're not all scattered over the face of China. What bugs me most is Biff being spotted by now. An American kid among all those Chinese. Bound to be. I don't think so, Muscles. Biff and Chuba worked out a disguise that made Biff look more like a Chinese than Chuba does. Biff not only fooled me, but fooled T. Peo as well. He fooled Chuba's father? That's really something. Jack nodded his head. Yeah, both of those kids are plenty smart. I think they'll make it in. They might even get a line on Charlie's whereabouts. But getting back out, Jack shook his head soberly. That's where we get into the act, Muscles said quickly. Look, I got the Cessna tuned up, so she's purring like a kitten. Extra fuel tanks installed. We can go in, pick up Charlie and the kids. If we could find them. We can find them. Look, here's my idea. We go in together at night. You drop me. I locate Charlie and the kids. Then I make a signal on the shortwave transmitter, and bang, you come, pick us up, and all's well. Jack didn't answer at once. He was considering Muscle's idea. You make it sound so easy, but I don't know. Give me a little time to think it over. We can take off at dusk tonight. I haven't said we would yet, Muscles. I'll let you know. Muscles glowed at Jack and pounded one huge fist into the palm of his other ham-like hand. Biff didn't hesitate. This was real trouble. If he didn't get to his friend at once, Chuba might go under for good. Finding him beneath the surface of the muddy river would be impossible. Biff's body split the air as he dived towards the sinking Chuba. Powerful strokes of his arms pulled Biff swiftly through the water. He reached Chuba. Take it easy, take it easy, Chuba. I've got you. You'll be all right. Don't fight me. Biff crooked his left arm around Chuba's neck. Just lie on your back, Chuba. I'll do the rest. At Biff's word, Chuba stopped thrashing. He forced himself to relax, buoyed both in body and spirit by the firmness of Biff's arm. Slowly, with a one-arm backstroke, Biff towed the native boy towards the shore. The current slackened below the falls, making Biff's task possible. Foot by foot, Biff propelled himself and Chuba towards the river bank. At long last, he felt one of his kicking feet touch bottom. OK, Chuba, I think you can stand up here. Try it. Chuba's feet touched bottom. The two boys staggered through the shallow water to safety. Chuba stretched out on the bank, gasping and trembling. You saved my life, Biff. How can Chuba ever thank you? 
Skip the thanks, Chuba. You've done plenty for me, and I know you'll do plenty more. But how come you never learn to swim? Not many Chinese boys swim. Not in rivers where I grow up. Crocodiles. I get it. Too dangerous. Chuba nodded his head. Look, Chuba, you rest here. I've got to get the boat. All our supplies are in it. Biff jumped up and ran along the bank downstream. The boat was drifting slowly, lazily towards the bank. Biff plunged back into the water. He reached the boat, pulled himself in over the side and rowed to shore. Chuba had moved down the bank and waded out to grab the boat's bow. He pulled it up on the bank. Half an hour later, the boys re-embarked. For the rest of the day, they travelled in smooth water. By dark, they reached Sun Hyango, last stop of their river voyage. From Sun Hangyo, they headed northwest toward the foothills of Mount Minya Konka, west of Chunking and Chengchu. Once clear of the river city, the boys moved along a dirt road until weariness overtook them. Off the road, they built a small fire, ate a mixture of flour and rice Chuba dreamed up, and then slept. In the morning, Chuba inspected Biff carefully. What's the matter, Biff demanded. You almost American boy again. More like fish called carp, though. All streaky. What do you mean? Your swims in river. Make betel juice fade. You look at self. We got make you Chinese beggar boy again. Chopper took out his bottle of juice and smeared Biff's body and face. Now all good again. We move out. And up, Biff said, looking towards the mountains. By late afternoon, Biff and Chuba reached a town in the foothills. They had been climbing steadily all day. Several times Biff had to swallow to clear the pressure in his ears, brought on by the higher altitude. You have some money, Biff? Chuba asked. Yep, got a bunch of Burmese rupees. Can you spend them in China? Spend them like you say, like water. Rupees much good, better than Chinese money. Chinese money now called Jin Min Pio takes many gins to make one rupee. Biff dug into his bundle and brought out several coins. This enough? It's plenty. We go into town to market. Chuba buy some food. You like dried fish? Lychee nuts good too. Ugh, I'd rather have a hot dog. Ah, hot dog, Chuba nodded wisely. Muscles tell me in America you eat the dogs but like them hot. By the millions, Chuba. Especially at baseball games but not the kind that bark. Not real dogs? No, these are the sort like a sausage, shaped like sausage. You know sausage? Chuba nodded his head. Oh sure, stuffed with rice, shark fins and sesame seeds is real tasty. Biff shrugged, might as well give up. Chuba would just have to eat a genuine frankfurter some day. The boys walked on to the edge of the town. Biff stopped before they passed through the gate. Hold it a minute, Chuba, something I want to ask you. Biff had decided to make the first move toward locating his Uncle Charlie. He considered showing Chuba the green ring. Should he do so now or hold on to it for an ace in the hole, for a time when the ring might be the means of getting them out of a really tough jam? He'd wait. What you want to ask Chuba? I want to know if you ever heard of a big and well-known Chinese family. It was called the House of Quang. Biff studied the native boy's face. Sure, Chuba hear about them. Once they rich, big rich, own many, many acres for wheat fields, many, many acres for rice. They own big grain sheds where other people bring wheat and rice to sell them for to store it. But now no more rice, not rich and powerful any more. Revolution and new government get rid of all big landowners. Did the House of Quang have any property, any acres round here? No own acres here, but once they own big warehouse, like I say, for to buy and sell wheat and rice and all kinds of clothes and things. Here in this town, Chuba nodded his head. Well, look, Chuba, I think maybe my Uncle Charlie came into this part of China because of something he had to do with the House of Quang. I don't know exactly what. Do you think any members of that family would be around here? Chuba thought about Biff's question. I don't know, Biff, but can find out. Although family no longer strong and rich, Chuba has heard they still stick close together, help each other out. If one member of the family get in bad with government bosses, others get him out if he put in prison. 
Okay, that's what I wanted to know from you. When we get to the market, think you could ask some questions without giving us away? I mean, without letting the people you ask know that we're in here looking for Uncle Charlie. Think so, Biff. I ask if anyone hear about Big Bird, American bird with much roaring noise. Lots of people in this part of China still call airplane Big Bird. If you find anyone who seems to have the kind of information we're looking for, see if there's any talk about a plane cracking up around here. I feel sure Uncle Charlie would have come back long ago if it weren't something wrong with his plane. You trust Chuba, Biff. He find out everything's. The boys passed the gate of the wall town. This town was the largest one they had yet gone through. The dirty streets again were filled with people milling back and forth. Children stared at them wide-eyed and curious. Dogs darted in and out, looking for scraps of food. Pigs roamed the streets, paying no more attention to the people than the people did to them. Biff could tell they were nearing the marketplace. His nose knew. Inside the market, an open-air market filling one long block, the boys passed booths selling everything from hot soups to shiny silks. Strings of garlic hung on racks in all the food booths. The Chinese chew garlic the way Americans chew gum. Small cakes made of chopped vegetables and fruits were piled high on trays. There were fried peanuts and sugar-covered orange peels. Strings of dried fish swung in the air. Smoked ducks were suspended by their necks from long, slender bamboo rods. Chuba made several purchases. Biff, having to remain silent, was unable to protest against some of the food Chuba added to his cloth sack. But he knew he'd have to be mighty hungry to eat them. At one booth where Chuba made several purchases, the native boy had a long talk with the owner. During the conversation, Chuba once extended his arms straight from his sides and gave out a sound like an airplane engine, an engine that spluttered. The Chinese only shook his head. The boys walked along. I think he knows something, but no tell me, Chuba said quietly. When first I ask about Big Bird, a look on his face tell me he has heard of something, but when I ask more and become airplane myself, he says no, he hear of nothing. I ask more people. Biff tagged along, silent, watchful, amazed at many of the strange things sold in the market. He saw a goose egg and watched a shopper haggle with the owner over its price. Later, Chuba told him the egg was four years old and uncooked. Most delicious, Chuba said. Biff shuddered. Every store sold dried watermelon seeds. Chuba bought some, gave a handful to Biff. Biff chewed on them, but found little taste to the small morsel inside the shell. It had become dark. Flares lighted the marketplace. Chuba turned to Biff, a discouraged look on his face. Buying things fine. Finding out about Sahib Charlie not fine. Chuba learned nothing. The boys retraced their steps back to the city gates. Again, they were going to sleep in the open. Biff much preferred this to sleeping on the floor of an airless room. Just as they passed through the gate, a figure came out of the shadows. He touched Chuba on the arm, and in a hissing whisper, spoke into the boy's ear. Man, say for me to come back with him. Maybe can help me. Say I must come alone. You stay right here, Biff. Chuba be all right. Be back quick. Chuba and the stranger headed back toward the market. But Chuba didn't come back quickly. The minute seemed to drag along. Biff was becoming worried. He had just about made up his mind to seek Chuba out when he saw his friend running towards him. Chuba was breathless, more from excitement than from his short run. Chuba has news, big news. Man takes me back to another fellow. This other fellow much wise. Say he hear big American plane make forced landing, near mountains, maybe fifty miles from here. Did he tell you how long ago, Chuba? Chuba nodded his head up and down rapidly. He say maybe three, maybe four weeks ago. Hey, that is good news. That could be Uncle Charlie. Did he know what happened to the pilot? Was he hurt? I asked that, but fellow say he don't know. 
Biff was thoughtful for a few moments. It's a good lead, Chuba. You know which way to go? Sure. Fellow tell Chuba. Seems to me this fellow told you a lot. I wonder why, particularly since no one else seemed to know what you were talking about. I don't know, Biff. Fellow very nice, but funny-looking fellow. What do you mean, funny-looking? One eye closed like door. No see out of it. Fellow have only one good eye. Biff's thoughts raced back to the Chinese passenger on the plane from Indianapolis to Chicago. A Chinese with a drooping eyelid. End of chapter 13. The First Clue Chapter 14 of The Mystery of the Chinese Ring by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 The Circling Plane. The next day, in a small village of only a few mud and thatched houses, Chuba continued his inquiries. This time, the second man he asked told of having heard of a big bird roar like the thunders of heaven. It had been seen coming down in the mountains. In mid-afternoon of the second day after leaving the market town, Chuba came up with more definite information. He was told that a flying man had come down in the foothills near a police outpost called Jeraminka. Chuba was elated by the news that now seemed to be coming to them so easily. Too easily, Biff said. How you mean, Biff? I'm not sure, Chuba, but it seems strange to me that everyone seems to be helping us along. It's as if we are being guided to this certain place. That is not good? Biff shook his head. It's too good. It could be a trap. I'm pretty sure now that someone has spotted me, or at least knows I'm in this part of China. How could they know that? You look like Chinese boy, not like American Biff Brewster. Biff didn't reply at once. He was thinking. He was thinking that by asking questions about the house of Quang, about a downed flyer, someone's curiosity had been aroused. Someone was very interested in his search for Charles Keane. Otherwise, how had it been so easy to get the information Chuba had been given? Biff also felt sure that the person or persons responsible for feeding Chuba directional information must know that it was he, Biff Brewster, who was in China. He couldn't drive from his mind the picture of the Chinese with the drooping eyelid. Chuba's description of the man with one eye fitted too closely. Chuba, I think we're definitely being led into a trap. Someone is leading us to the place where my uncle is. It may be friends, it may be members of the House of Quang, but it also may be enemies of my uncle. They may be holding my uncle prisoner and want to capture me too. Don't ask me why, I don't know all the answers, but I've got a hunch. If we being led into trap like poor little goat into dragon's mouth, maybe we better stop, maybe go different way, maybe better give Jaraminka the bygo, Chuba suggested. Biff smiled. No, we won't give Jaraminka the go by. We'll let ourselves be led into or up to the trap. It's our only chance of finding my uncle. We don't have any other leads, but maybe we can get right up to the trap and avoid having it sprung on us. The boys climbed a narrowing mountain trail higher into the foothills. Nightfall found them in a wild, desolate spot. No lights could be seen in any direction they looked. At the altitude they had reached, a chill came with the night air. Chuba hurried about searching for dried dead wood. He heaped up a large pile. Think it's safe to build a fire? Biff asked. Sure, much safe. Better to have fire and be warm. Better also to have fire to keep mountain bears and wild pigs away. Anyway, who want to catch two boys? I don't know, Chuba. I don't know, Biff replied. The fire was soon blazing, sending out its friendly warmth and brightening the wild spot where the boys had decided to pitch their camp. Chuba had water boiling in a small can, ready for the rice which had become their nightly meal. Rice, with some of the strange foods Chuba had purchased, stirred in it. Chow, Biff, we eat. I weigh out hungry, man. Chuba started ladling out the steaming dish. 
Hold it a minute, Chuba. Hear anything? Chuba raised his head. Both boys tensed. From far away to the south there came a low hum, not much louder than the buzz of a bee. As the boys listened, the hum grew louder and more distinct. A minute passed. There was no mistaking the sound now. It's a plane, Chuba, a plane. Maybe Sahib Charlie, Chuba shouted. Look, look. Biff was on his feet, pointing. Now the plane was in sight against the darkening sky. It was coming low. Its green starboard wing light and red port wing light were flashing alternately on and off, on and off. The plane seemed to be coming directly at them, as if attracted moth-like to their bright fire. It swooped over the boys so low they both involuntarily ducked. Then the plane circled, roared back over them, and then disappeared over a low ridge to the west. The sound of its twin engines died away. I'd bet you anything that was a Cessna, like the job that brought me to Unhaya from Rangoon, Biff said, his voice filled with excitement. You mean like playing that muscle's fix for Sahib's back at camp? That's right, Chuba. Can't be sure, though. Maybe he was scouting plane of army. Maybe he was spying on us, Chuba said. Biff's spirit sank. Chuba could be right. Think we better get out of here, then. Find another place and hide. Might be good idea, Biff. Hate to leave nice warm fire, though. And I'd hate to leave just in case that was a plane from Unhaya looking for us. Or, as you said, it could just be Uncle Charlie. The boy sat down by the fire. Biff ate his food slowly. The minutes became an hour. Another hour passed. Chuba had curled up in his long cloak and was sound asleep. Biff looked at the sleeping boy and felt a yawn stretching over his face. He stirred the fire, pulled his long cloak firmly about him and curled up too. He didn't think he could sleep. His mind was too filled with thoughts about the plane. But Biff's resistance to sleep was mostly in his mind, not in his body. Tired, he always seemed tired these days. He dropped off to sleep in seconds. How long he slept, Biff didn't know, but he did know that something had awakened him. He opened his eyes. He listened. He thought he heard a sound just behind a nearby stunted tree. Chuba, he poked his companion. Chuba, wake up. Chuba stirred, rolled over, and opened his eyes to look into Biff's face. What is it, Biff? I think somebody's watching us from just outside the ring of the fire's light. Both boys remained silent. Nothing happened. Then the sound came again. Someone or something was certainly watching them. Biff could hear his own heartbeat. He looked in the direction of the sound. A huge figure stepped from behind the tree. As it walked towards the fire, its dancing shadow became that of a giant. Well, fancy meeting you here, the giant said. Muscles! The boys jumped to their feet. The giant mechanic, a big grin splitting his face, strode up to the fire. Biff and Chuba leaped on him, pounding him on the back. Easy, boys, easy. I'm footsore and bone-tired from walking over these here mountains. Never had anything like them back in good old Kentucky. How did you get here? Was that your plane? Who was flying it? Where'd you land? Is my uncle safe? Biff's question shot out in a rapid-fire burst. Easy, Biff, easy, one at a time. Now I'll try to answer your quiz program. No word from your uncle. Yet yeah, that was me in that plane that flew over here a couple of hours ago. Jack Hudson was flying her. We touched down just long enough for me to hop out. Jack's almost back to Unheo by now. Now, how about a spot of China tea? I'm tired and hungry. Me fix muscles right away. Chop, chop. Chuba got busy. More wood went on the fire. Out came the all-purpose can, this time to boil water for muscles' tea. Now, what about you two? Give me a fill-in. Biff quickly sketched the happening since he and Chuba had slipped out of the camp at Unheo. So you think someone spotted you, Muscles asked. I'm sure of it. Someone sure knows Uncle Charlie's being looked for. We've been getting more information than they hand out at Grand Central Station in New York. And you've been told that a plane came down near a place called Jaraminka. Biff nodded his head. How far is that place from here? Not far, Chuba replied. Maybe a day's walk. If we start early in the morning, here's your tea. Muscles took the hot liquid. Well then, Jaraminka, here we come. 
As Muscles sipped his tea, he told the boys about landing on a cleared, level plateau over a ridge of the Thanglung foothills to the west. Not too far from here, Muscles looked at his watch. Took me about two hours to walk back to this fire we spotted from the air. We couldn't be sure, of course, but we hoped it would be you boys. I guess I must have walked almost straight up and down farther than I walked straight ahead to get here. And Jack went back, Biff asked. Yeah, but we've got it all fixed. When we find Charlie, we're to make our way back to that plateau. I've got a portable transmitter with me. When we get there, I make a signal. Jack flies in, and it's back to Unheo we go. Muscles made it sound so simple. Biff felt good as he listened to the big man talk so confidently. But there were lots of ifs. If they found Charles Keen, if they got back to the plateau, if the signal was heard on time, if Jack could come back in. Biff shook his head. It was good to have big muscles with them, though. In any trouble, muscles had a lot of weight to throw around. Now suppose we catch some more of that stuff called shut-eye. Sleep to you, Chuba, and be up and at them early in the a.m. Chuba catch plenty of eyes shut, Sahib muscles. Tomorrow going to be big days. I shut. The two words reminded Biff of the Chinese with the drooping eyelid. The two boys and the man stretched out by the fire and slept. At daybreak, muscles stirred. He rubbed the sleep from his eyes and sat up. Hey, he exclaimed, looks like we've got visitors. Biff and Chuba sat up quickly. Standing silently, forming a ring surrounding the three and the dying embers of the fire, were eight of the fiercest-looking men Biff had ever seen. End of chapter 14「Fifteen of the Mystery of the Chinese Ring by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 Bandits Biff shot a quick look at Chuba. He wanted to see his friend's reaction to the startling appearance of these men, who looked as if they had sprung from the age of primitive man. Good? Bad? Chuba would know. Chuba's eyes roved over the group. He turned his head quickly from man to man, turning around to complete the circle. A frown on the native boy's face gave Biff his answer. Chuba was worried. Man, oh man, did you ever see anything like that bunch? Muscles asked. They're from way out of nowhere. There was every reason for Muscles to be amazed. The men were small but squat and powerfully built. Their eyes were slanted in broad, dirty faces, the colour of stained copper. Wide, cruel mouths turned down on either side. Scraggly strands of wiry hair sprouted from ragged caps made of mangy fur. Their legs were wrapped in rags. Coats, if they could be called coats, were made of skins of wild animals, mountain goats, deer. One of the men wore the skin of the Himalayan black bear. They stood in silence, their small beady eyes watching for any move on the part of Muscles and the boys. Two of the men held short, thick clubs in their hands. Another held a long stick. Biff noticed that on the end a wicked knife had been attached by thongs. Others held long, gleaming, curved knives in their hands. Only one man carried a gun, a short, two-barreled shotgun. It was an old gun. Somebody had sawed off the barrel. It could deal out body-ripping shots at short range. Who are they, Chuba? Biff asked. You mean what are they? Muscles cut in. Bandits, Chinese bandits, Chuba replied. They bad, very bad. They're not soldiers, then. Not members of any patrol. Chuba shook his head. No, much worse. These people roam the hills and mountains. They steal, kill. They like wild men. Sometimes come into town, but most times... Live like tribe, sleep in caves, eat anything they can kill. What do they want with us? Biff asked. Rob us, maybe kill us if we try to fight. Huh, some chance, Muscles cut in again. Why, I can take on that whole gang single-handed. Muscles towered over the bandits. He was bigger and weighed more than any two of the bandits together. Not so sure, Muscles, Chuba said quietly. These men fight and kill bears, tigers. Only use their knives. 
Only guy that worries me is that one with the sword-off shotgun, Muscles decided. Why don't they say something, Chuba? What are they waiting for? Biff asked. Chuba shrugged his shoulders. Can't they talk? Can you understand their language? They talk, sure, but be hard for Chuba to understand them. They speak what you call tribe dialect, some Chinese words, some words only they know. Can they understand you? Sure, they understand most Chinese talk. Not all words, but enough. Ask them what they want. Chuba swallowed. He directed a rapid string of Chinese words at the man carrying the gun. The gun carrier grunted and spoke in a deep, guttural voice to the man beside him. Did you get that, Chuba? Chuba shook his head. The gun carrier took one step forward. He looked muscles carefully up and down. Next his eyes swept over Biff. Then he spoke, turning his eyes on Chuba. He spoke slowly. Sometimes moments of silence would appear between his spaced words. He says they want all things we have. Gunman speaker says he wants clothes of the giant man. My clothes, fat chance, muscles snarled. The bandit spoke again. He says open up bundles. He wants to see what we have. Biff knelt down. His and Chubba's bulky bundles were together. Biff started untying the nearest one, which happened to be Chubba's. If we give them our things, will they let us alone? Biff asked. Chubba can't say. Maybe so-so. Maybe no. Maybe they give us this. Chubba brought his hand swiftly across his throat. Biff felt a sickening sensation in his stomach. Feeling around in Chubba's bundle, Biff's hand struck an oblong object. It felt like a box. Biff carefully lifted the cloth from which the bundle was made. He raised it so that the bandits would be unable to see what the box was. If the situation hadn't been such a dangerous one, Biff would have laughed. Chuba had brought with him his evil spirit box, the one muscles had frightened Chuba with the first morning Biff was in camp. Touching the box, an idea came into Biff's head. Chuba, quick, tell me more about these bandits. Are they superstitious? I mean, frightened by strange things, things they'd never seen before. Much afraid, big fear of spirits. Biff nodded his head. I got an idea. Think we could scare them with your evil spirit box? Excitement danced in Chuba's eyes. They'd be scared like crazy, more scared than Chuba was. OK, we'll try it. Now you tell them something like this. Tell them we are protected by magic of the gods. The evil spirit will put its hand on them unless they let us go. They are not to bother us. Make it good. Bow down and stuff like that. Look to the sky and make like you're calling the spirit. Chuba, catch wise. Make big show. OK, now at some point when you're putting on your act, when the bandits are all looking at you... I'll yell, fly. When I do, I'll toss your spirit box in the air. You swing round and catch it. I'll have it started. You hold it up high when the siren's going. Then place it on the ground and jump back when the hand comes out. Tell them that's the hand of the evil spirit reaching out to touch them. Chuba was grinning now. Muscle stood there, hands on hips, shaking his head. Chuba turned back to the bandit leader. He hunched up his shoulders. He twisted his face into an ugly leer. Then he began speaking. He spoke at first in a sing-song voice. He spoke faster and faster, raising his voice higher. He dropped down and touched the ground three times with his head. Up he leapt, extending his arms skyward. Chuba was putting on a good show. Biff watched the faces of the bandits closely. There was no expression, yet their eyes followed every movement Chuba made. Biff took the spirit box out. No one saw him. Even Muscles was fascinated by Chuba's writhing, his sing-song chanting. Biff touched the button, activating the box. Fly, he called out. He tossed the box in the air, high enough so that it came down over Chuba's head. It almost appeared to be falling from the sky. Chuba caught the box deftly. Again he spoke to the bandits. He raised the box high over his head, just as the first faint whine of the siren began. The siren scream rose higher and higher. Quickly, Chuba placed the box on the ground and stepped back. The lid of the box slowly opened. Biff looked again at the bandits. The faces without expression now looked curious, then terrified. The lid of the box raised. The plastic hands snaked out. Stark terror now seized the bandits. They cringed back. One of them, unable to stand it any longer, turned, broke and ran. He was followed by another and another. 
Only the leader remained, staring at the spirit box as if spellbound. Muscles went into action. He dived for the box. He snatched it from the ground, turned, and with the box extended in his outstretched hands, he moved towards the bandit chief. This was too much. With a horrified shriek, the bandit chief turned and raced down the slope after his companions. All were running as if they were really pursued by demons. Muscles quickly reset the box, so that the scream of the siren, raising to its highest pitch, seemed to be following close to the bandit's ears. Muscles put the box back on the ground. He slapped his huge thighs. He threw back his head and roared with laughter. Biff and Chuba joined in. All three laughed until they sank to the ground, their voices shaking as they tried to talk. Finally, Muscles heaved his shoulders and took a deep breath. Ever see anything like that? Those guys were really scared, took off like jet fighters. When I think that I sent to the States for that fool toy to scare Chuba, well... Never knew it was going to save your life, did you? Still think twenty dollars was too much for it, Biff said, trying to control his laughter. I level with you now, Muscles. I real scared first time I see Spirit Box, Chuba confessed. But those guys, they really did think the evil spirit was going to put the hand on them, Muscles said. Here's one time I'm glad you can't tell good from evil, Biff said. Think they'll come back, Chuba? Muscles asked. Never. They really gone. Give us the big go-round now. Not ever want to see us and Box again. The spirit really moved them, eh, Biff? Muscles said. Biff laughed, but Muscles' joke was over Chuba's head. It was almost broad daylight now. The sun was rising. Biff stood up. We'd better get going. Maybe we can reach Jeraminka by nightfall. Okay by me, Muscles agreed. Let's make with the feet, Chuba. Biff looked northward. Nestled somewhere in the foothills of the Thanglung Mountains was the outpost of Jaraminka. Uncle Charlie might be there. He might be the bait being used to bring Biff and his companions into a trap. It was a risk they would have to take. End of chapter 15《Chapter Sixteen of the Mystery of the Chinese Ring by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen: Strange Discovery. In the distance, perhaps a hundred miles away, the towering peak of Mount Minyakonka, reaching twenty-five thousand feet skyward, could be seen. The day was clear, crystal blue clear. The air was chill and would remain so until the sun's rays bore down more strongly. You better take the lead, Chuba, Muscles said. Off we go, searching for Jaraminka. He sang his last sentence to the tune of the Air Force song, Into the Wild Blue Yonder. Hold it a minute, Biff said. You know, if we head straight for Jaraminka, we might be walking right into the hands of the enemy. Wouldn't they expect us to take the most direct route? You got something there, Biff, me boy. What you're cooking? Muscles asked. I think we should head west, northwest, rather than due north. Head for Minya Konka. Then, when we've gone further inland, cut back north and make our approach to Jaraminka from the west. Good idea, Biff. Let's move out. The three trudged westward, climbing, climbing. Big, craggy rocks dotted the sides of the slopes they scrambled up. Often they had to make wide detours to get round a cliff that rose straight up. After two hours of scrambling, slipping, struggling against the rugged terrain, muscles called a halt. We'd better take a break. The rarefied air of the altitude had all three panting for breath. At muscles' words, Biff and Chuba sank to the ground without a word. Muscles flung himself to the ground beside them. Slowly their breathing became more even, strength flowed back into their bodies. Muscles sat up, pulled out a cigarette. He lit it, took three deep puffs and tossed it away. Burns my lungs at this altitude. How far you figure we've gone, kids? Like you said last night, if we measure the ups and downs, then we've covered quite a distance. But I doubt if we cover more than five miles straight away. Biff answered, and Chuba nodded in agreement. 
That plateau where Jack landed me must be just a short distance south of here. I'm making landmarks so we can spot the place when we come back, Muscles explained. Biff looked the area over carefully too. Two peaks rose straight up, miles apart. A smaller peak was centered exactly between the two taller ones. Just like the letter W, Biff said to himself. He would remember that. Think we better turn north now, Biff, Muscles said. Be a lot easier traveling. Faster, too. We'll be moving along the valley. Not so much of this up and down stuff, particularly the up. I've had enough of that. I'll take my climbing in a plane. I guess so, Muscles. We'll head up the valley now, Chuba, Biff directed. They set off again. Travelling was easier. They moved along briskly. The air was becoming warmer, and soon the floor of the valley sent out shimmering heat waves in front of them. Except for brief pauses, no one called for a break until Muscles looked at his watch. It's noon. How about a breather and something to eat? Chuba broke out his supply of food. His goodies, Biff had named them. This is food, Muscles asked sceptically, looking at the portion Chuba handed him. He ate it, but his face twisted comically as he tasted and then quickly gulped the food. After half an hour rest, during which Muscles complained bitterly about the menu, they were ready to continue. Their progress up the valley continued smoothly for the first hour. Rounding a sharp bend, the valley came to an abrupt end. Now what's this little obstacle placed in our path, Muscles asked. Wish it were just a little obstacle, Biff replied. Directly ahead of them, the ground angled sharply upward. Above it leveled off like the outside rim of a giant football stadium. We go right or we go left, Chubber, Muscles asked. We'll go straight up, Biff replied. Let's see what's on top. Surely can't tell from here. After we take a look-see, we'll probably bear to the right. Jaraminka must be off that way. Biff pointed slightly to the northeast. Think so, Chuba? Chuba nodded his head. They mounted towards the rim of the top of the sharp incline. In places the ground rose so sharply they had to pull themselves up, grabbing the stunted trees for handhold. Nearing the top, they ran into a barrier that stopped them cold. This was a man-made obstacle, the last thing to expect in this wild, remote country. It was a heavy, metal-barred fence. It stood higher than Muscles' head, and three strands of ugly barbed wire were stretched along the top. What the... Muscles' eyes bugged out in astonishment. The fence stretched out to the right and left in a long curve. The ground was cleared on both sides of the fence, forming a path easy to walk along. This we have to find out about, Biff said. Why fence in a mountain top unless there is something inside that's top secret? That fence could be electrified. Stay clear of it, Muscles warned. Could be, Biff said, but I doubt it. It would take a lot of power to do it. Besides, where would the power come from? Let's follow it to the right, but be alert. Good fences don't mean good neighbours here. I've a hunch these good fences mean good guards every few feet. They followed the curving fence cautiously and on the alert. Biff took the lead. They continued until Biff figured they had covered ninety degrees of a gigantic circle. The fence remained an equal distance from the rim at the top as they followed the path. Hold it, Biff held up his hand. Then he motioned Muscles and Chuba forward. Look, Biff pointed to a gap, wide enough and deep enough for a man's body to slip beneath the fence. Some animal must have been as curious as we are, Biff said. Something burrowed under the fence. Well, what are we waiting for? Muscles grinned. He dropped to his hands and knees and wiggled through the opening. Chuba followed and Biff brought up the rear. Crouching low, the three approached the top of the rise. They crawled the last few feet, reached the rim, and raised their heads slowly. What they saw made them all gasp. They were looking into an immense bowl, covering an area so great it was impossible to take it in with one look. They pivoted their heads, following the rim of the bowl. The activity on the floor of the bowl made them squint their eyes in disbelief. Everywhere they looked they saw bulldozers, huge cranes, steam shovels, and thousands of men working furiously. The bottom of the bowl was so far away that the working men seemed like small moving specks. 
The noises of the steam shovels digging into the earth and the whines of the huge crane arms turning on their metal discs rose only dimly to the ears of the astonished spectators. Towards the opposite side of the huge bowl, two cement runways in the shape of a plus sign were dotted with planes. In still another section of the bowl, great steel trilons, resembling oversized high-tension wire supporters, reared skyward. What do you make of it? Biff asked Muscles. The burly mechanic scratched his head. You got me. Could be a lot of things. It's got to be something mighty important, something really top secret to build this gigantic complex in this remote spot. And how did they get all this stuff in here? Muscles asked himself. I think, Biff said, we'd better get away from here, but fast. Muscles nodded in agreement. The three backed down, reached the fence, scrambled beneath it, and headed for Jeraminka. Making as much speed as they could, they put distance between themselves and their startling discovery. Biff's mind was filled with questions. Foremost among them was one which kept coming back, like an exam question he couldn't answer. Did this tremendous secret construction job have anything to do with Uncle Charlie's flight into China? End of chapter 16「Seventeen of the Mystery of the Chinese Ring by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seventeen: A Red Hot Lead. Night overtook Biff, Chuba, and Muscles before they reached Jeraminka. All were tired. The going in the dark was rough, but Biff was determined to reach the town before they halted. Another hour, Biff said, and if we haven't gotten there, we'll hole in for the night. Okay by me, Muscles answered. Chuba nodded his head. They didn't have to go for the full hour. Following a narrow path, no more than a rough goat trail, they rounded the side of a high-pointed hill. From far below their dangerous perch on the hillside, they saw lights, hundreds of lights, flickering like candles in a breeze. It was a beautiful sight, to come upon suddenly in the night. Jaraminka, Biff said, and looked at Chuba for confirmation. You're right, Biff, that's Jaraminka. It's a lot bigger place than I thought it would be, Muscles put in. It's in center of big, wide valley. Much good farmlands. Many rich peoples once lived here. It's nice in summer, not too hot. How about the house of Quang, Chuba? They have any properties around Jaraminka? Oh, yes, Biff, always in summer time, Old Lord and family go to Jaraminka. Old Lord have big place here, his big house still here, but Old Lord not own it any more. Chinese commies run him out, Muscles asked. You're right, Muscles, they take over. Now this place big, important outpost for Chinese army. Why would the Chinese army have a large installation in such a wild, remote section of their big, sprawling country? The answer came to Biff immediately. That big fenced-in construction job was not more than ten miles away. That had to be the reason. Just what was being built, though, still puzzled the boy. We'll bed down here for the night, Biff said, and go into the town early in the morning. Real early, Biff, Chuba said. Soon as sun start rising, farmers go into town to marketplace, bring things from farm to sell. We go in with them. People think we farmers too. How about me, Muscles asked. I don't look like a Chinese farmer. Biff laughed. Anything but. You have to stay here, guard our camp. We go into town, find out things. Okay by me, but say, be sure and leave me my pal. Your pal, Biff asked. Yeah, my pal of protection, the spirit box. They all laughed, turned in and slept. Early in the grey of the morning, Biff and Chuba were on the outskirts of the village. A stream of solemn-faced farmers passed through the city's gate. Chuba and Biff attached themselves to the parade and entered unnoticed. Biff had reached a decision. If any member of the House of Quang could be located, he felt now would be the time to use the green ring. Keeping his voice low, he spoke to Chuba. Don't ask any more questions about Uncle Charlie, 
but find out if you can if there are any members of the Quang family around here. I catch Biff. If any Quang's around, Chuba will locate them. The boys wandered through the sprawling city. They made for the marketplace, always the centre of the most activity. Going from stall to stall, Chuba made his inquiries. He told the persons he questioned that once he and his father had served the house of Quang. Now, he said, in a sad, tearful voice, he was only a beggar boy. If he could only find one of the young lords, perhaps, the lord would remember his father and give Chuba a helping hand. At mid-morning, Chuba hit pay dirt. He engaged in a long conversation with a young, slender Chinese. This Chinese was different from the broad-faced farmers, the stallkeepers, the uniformed soldiers who thronged the marketplace. His facial features were fine, his clothing cleaner and richer than that of those surrounding him. Biff watched Chuba anxiously. He saw his friend bob his head up and down in agreement. Then the two parted. Chuba rejoined Biff, motioned to him to follow, and Chuba led the way back to the gates of the city. Once outside, Chuba told Biff of his conversation. This man I talked to, his name Chan Li, once he young lord of house, like house of Quang, not so big, not so rich, but house of Li and house of Quang, good friends. House of Li taken over just like house of Quang. He hate government bosses. Biff felt himself becoming excited. This could be the lead they'd been searching for. Did you ask him if any members of the House of Quang were still in Jaraminka? Chuba did. Chan Li say yes. He say he know many things, but he say he must be very careful. Cannot take us to where Quang family in hideout unless we have proof we friends, not enemies or police spies. Biff's hand went inside his cloak. He felt for the ring. This was it. The ring would bring the good fortune it promised. What's our next move? We go back to where Muscle's hiding. Then, when sun stands straight up in sky over our heads, we meet with Chan Li. Where? Back in the city? Oh no, too much risky. Remember, on our way down to city, we come to Little Brook, fed by spring? Biff nodded his head. We meet there. Come, we tell Muscle's. Back with muscles, the three held a council. Their plans depended on what they would learn from Chan Li. But how could muscles be kept informed? It wouldn't do for him to attend the meeting. Maybe I could be there but not be seen, muscles said. Any cover near the spring where I could hide? Maybe I could overhear what this Li character has to offer. I think so, muscles. Come, we go down now and see. Not too long before sun stands straight up. Near the spring they found a heavy thicket where Muscles could conceal himself. When you're translating for Biff, raise your voice slightly, Chuba. Not loud enough to cause suspicion, but loud enough for me to hear. Let's have a dry run of that, Biff suggested. Muscles concealed himself in the thicket. Chuba talked to Biff in a tone slightly louder than normal. You hear all right, Muscles? Biff asked. You're coming through loud and clear, was the reply. How much time before noon? Ten minutes, Muscles called back. Chuba spoke to Biff. You stay here now. I go a little piece downhill, see if I can spot Chan Li coming up. Chuba left. Biff remained silent, not wanting to give Muscles' position away by talking to him any more. In a few minutes, Chuba returned. His face told Biff the story. He's coming. Be here real quick. Is he alone? He by himself. Good, Biff thought. If Chan Li acted suspiciously or tried any funny stuff, Muscles lay in waiting. Chan Li came into the small clearing around the spring. He bowed low to Chuba, then repeated the gesture to Biff. He asked who you are, Biff, Chuba translated. Tell him I am a friend of the House of Quang. I seek their help. Interpreter Chuba spoke swiftly. He says he needs proof of this. He must be sure you are real true friend. It was now or never, Biff decided. He reached under his cloak and took out his keychain. Turning his back to Chuba and Chan Li, he took the ring off the chain. Turning, he held it out. Ask Chan Li if this is proof enough. The slender Chinese stepped forward. He took the ring from Biff's hand. He inspected it carefully, then replaced it in Biff's hand. 
"'It is the ring of the Ancient One, the old lord of the House of Quang,' he said to Chuba. When Chuba gave this information to Biff, his heart pounded with excitement. "'Now tell him, Chuba, that we come here to find my Uncle Charles, or to get any definite information as to where he is.' Chuba's head went up and down. He spoke to Chan Li. Their conversation went on and on. Biff's anxiety grew. Chan Li's answer was all important. At long last, much to Biff's relief, the conversation ended. It was a solemn-faced Chuba who turned to Biff. He has told me many things, many things we wanted to know. Well, what are they? What are they? Biff demanded impatiently. He says Sahib Charles is being hidden from soldiers by House of Quang. What? Biff clapped his hands. He couldn't contain his joy. Tell me more. Chan Li says more, that Sahib Charles hurt self when plane came down. Biff's joyful feeling vanished. Badly? Was he hurt badly? No, not too bad, but enough to keep him from travelling. Now he all better. All is arranged for House of Quang to help Sahib Charles get back to Burma. What can we do to help? Chan Li will take us to hideout place. We get Sahib Charles, lead him back to... Biff held up his hand. Wait. Biff felt there was still need for caution. He didn't want Chuba to mention the plan for the plane pickup. He didn't want him to reveal Muscle's presence. There was no way of knowing whether Chan Li understood English or not. Until they reached Uncle Charlie, it would be wiser, Biff felt, to hold back what little ammunition they still had. Ask him where is this hideout where my uncle is. Chuba turned back to Chan Li. He spoke rapidly. Chan Li replied and pointed in a direction north of Jaraminka. Just north of the city, in those foothills you can see from here. How long will it take us to get there? Biff was asking these questions for the benefit of the hidden muscles. An hour, says Chan Li. Maybe a little more, but not much. And is he ready to take us there now? Chuba again nodded assent to the question. Tell him, then, that we are ready to go right now. Chuba spoke to Chan Li. The Chinese replied with a deep bow and the sweep of one arm, as if to say, I lead, you follow. As if speaking to himself, but in a clear voice, Biff said, An hour there, an hour with Uncle Charlie, and an hour back. A bit more, perhaps. Four hours at the most. Biff stressed the words, four hours. He hoped Muscles would understand. He hoped Muscles would know that if they weren't back in four hours, then something had gone wrong. With Chan Li in the lead, they headed for the distant foothills. End of chapter 17「Eighteen of the Mystery of the Chinese Ring by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter eighteen The House of Quang Muscles didn't move. He kept his eyes glued to his watch until ten minutes had passed. Not until then did he think it safe to come out of his hiding place. He had overheard every word. He, too, had been thrilled at hearing that his good friend, Charles Keane, was safe. Going back up the hillside, being very careful to take the protection of all cover on the way, Muscles muttered to himself his admiration of Biff. Smart kid, that Biff, he said softly. He's not showing his whole hand. He wants to be shown first. Muscles looked at his watch. The hands pointed to 12.30. Four hours, Biff said. That will make it 4.30. Muscles grinned. If they're not back by that time, Muscles is going to muscle in. Nothing was said for the first half hour as Chan Li led Biff and Chuba into the foothills to the north of Jaraminka. Chan followed a course which curved around the city. The city lay below them, about three miles away nestled in the centre of an oval-shaped valley, rimmed by hills. The growth on the sloping hillside was thick, but the path they travelled was wide and cleared enough for easy going. They made good speed. When they reached a point almost due north of the city, the path turned sharply to the left and the incline steepened. 
They puffed their way up the path, putting the city farther and farther behind them. After a particularly steep climb, they reached the level area. Looking ahead, Biff saw that the path came to a dead end against a low stone wall. Gaping holes in the wall showed that it had been a long, long time since any care had been taken of it. Chan Li came to the wall and scrambled over it. Biff and Chuba followed. Chan Li called a halt once they were inside the wall and standing in a thick clump of trees. Chan spoke to Chuba. Chuba interpreted to Biff. Chan say we almost there. Must go most careful now. Ahead is old house, big house, once house of important family. Family all dead. Only evil spirits remain. People afraid of old house. Chan Li pushed deeper into the woods. Biff had no chance to voice suspicions that were growing in him. He felt that such a house must be known. But would the evil spirits keep authorities from investigating? Biff shook his head. He didn't like the situation. He couldn't tell exactly why, but his doubts grew stronger. True, the house was deep in a dense forest. It took quite a climb to reach it. It was a good five miles from the outskirts of Jeraminka, and there had been no sign of any other house on their path to reach it. The woods started to thin out. Biff could see they were coming to an opening. As they neared it, Biff saw the grey outlines of several buildings, linked together by a high stone wall. There was no sign of life. The buildings, low, sprawling, had an ominous, mysterious quality about them. The space between the woods and the house was just wide enough for what once must have been a moat. Chan Li led the boys to an arched opening in the wall, and they passed through it. Before them, Biff saw a large courtyard. A graveled pathway led to the main door. Three small pools were spaced on either side of the path from the opening to the house. As they neared the door, Biff sensed and felt the presence of someone behind him. He turned his head. Two Chinese soldiers, each with a revolver in hand, had closed in behind the three. Before Biff could raise his voice in protest or question Chan Li, the Chinese guide spoke. Welcome to the house of Quang. He entered the door. The guards moved up behind Biff and Chuba. There was nothing they could do but follow Chan Li. He led them down a long corridor. The corridor was lined with small rooms on each side. This may once have been the house of Quang, Biff told himself, but there was little doubt as to what it was being used for now. The small windows in the centre of the doors were barred. At several of the windows they passed, silent men stared out of the bars at them. At the end of the corridor, two more guards threw open a large, richly decorated door. Chan Li, a leer on his face now, bowed low, and with a sweep of his arm ushered the boys through. The courtyard of the Ancient One, the old lord of the House of Quang. He spoke the words in perfect English. In the centre of the room, two men sat on high-backed throne chairs. One of them was richly dressed in a flowing robe, decorated with red and gold dragons. The other man, much older, was in tattered clothing. A wispy beard waved downward from his chin. Both men wore tight-fitting skull caps. "'Approach, my friend,' said the richly dressed man. Biff and Chuba crossed the large room until they stood directly in front of the two men. On closer inspection, Biff saw that the speaker, who wore the rich clothing, had coarse facial features. His big, broad nose seemed to have been ironed onto his face. The other man, though poorly dressed, had a fine, proud face. He held his head high. His eyes, dimmed by the years, were the eyes of a frightened man, but a man who would face his fate without flinching. You are seeking the master of the house of Quang, I am informed, the younger man said. As he spoke, two men appeared from behind the chairs. One of them had but one good eye. The lid of the other eye drooped until the eye was shut. The Chinese of the Chicago Plain. The man turned on a triumphant smile toward Biff. We meet again, Mr. Brewster, he said. 
Silence, Mayo, commanded the richly robed man. You have, I am told, a ring with you, young man, a ring which indicates your great friendship for the house of Quang. The smile left the speaker's face. He leaned slightly forward, and his next words were a stern, crisp order. I'll take that ring. I am Ping Lu, master of the house. Biff reached into his pocket. He detached the ring and held it out in his open palm. Just as the richly robed man reached for it, the older man arose, bent forward, and snatched it. As he did, Ping Lu, with a sweep of his heavy arm, knocked the old man back into his chair. He seized the old man's hand and pried open his fist. He took the ring. The old man spoke. He spoke in Chinese. Ping Lu laughed as the old man poured out a stream of words. You may interpret for your American friend if you wish, Ping Lu said, addressing Chuba. The old one is the real master of the house of Quang, Chuba translated. He is called Teo Quang and is oldest of the remaining Quang family. The ring is his. He is much angered that it is now in hands of richly dressed man. Ping Lu cut in. True or true, once this old fool was the master of this house. Oh yes, this was one of the many houses owned by him. But I am master of this house now. It is used by me and my government as a place where we entertain, he chortled at the word entertain, our more important guests. And Teo Quang, though a doddering old fool now, once held sway over this territory, and still thinks he has much influence. Teo Quang spoke again. Again Chuba interpreted. Ancient ones say still many sons and nephews here, say for us not to be afraid. Of course there is nothing to be afraid of, Ping Lu said. I hope you will enjoy your stay with us. How long do you intend keeping us prisoners? Biff asked. Prisoners? Let us say guests. Of course, we will have to see that you are protected at all times. That is why it will be necessary to have you kept in a room guarded by two of my strongest soldiers. You ask how long will you be staying with us? Biff nodded his head. That, young man, depends on the cooperation I expect to get from you in a matter of great importance. What is it? Biff asked. You were here in due time. But first a few days rest here with us should, I think, do much to show you the absolute necessity of your cooperating. Biff didn't want to think of what the few days rest might mean. Tell me this, Ping continued. Your paying us this visit surely wasn't only because of your friendship with the House of Quang. I seem to remember being told of other inquiries your clever young friend made on your behalf. He motioned towards Chuba as he spoke. Biff decided on a show of boldness. There was nothing to be gained by cowering before this self-important official. You're right. I've come here in search of my uncle. His name is Charles Keane. So... Well, perhaps I can be of assistance to you. Perhaps the ring you brought with you from so many thousands of miles away will bring you good fortune. Biff felt like the mouse the cat was playing with. Is he here? Biff demanded. Ping Lu clapped his hands. The Chinese with the bad eye, whom he had called Mayo, came to him. Ping Lu leaned over and spoke softly into Mayo's ear. Neither Biff nor Chuba could hear what was said. Mayo left the room. Ping Lu turned to Chan Li. He had been standing just behind the boys during the conversation. You may go now, Chan Li, and your reward will be given you as you leave. Chan bowed and turned towards the door. Teo Quang, the ancient one, spat out a single word as Chan left. Biff looked at Chuba. He called him traitor, Chuba said. Ping Lu leaned back in his chair. He clasped his fat hands over his bulging belly. A smirk of satisfaction was stamped on his face. The rasp of a door opening on the right side of the huge room caused Biff to turn his head sharply. Through the door, prodded from behind by the gun barrels of two soldiers, walked Uncle Charlie. End of chapter 18
Chapter 19 of The Mystery of the Chinese Ring by Andy Adams This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 Uncle Charlie's Story Biff! Charles Keene shouted to his nephew hoarsely. He crossed the room and placed his hands on Biff's shoulders. Strangely, the guards made no move to stop him. Gee, Uncle Charlie, Biff broke off. He felt his voice choke up and knew he wasn't far from tears. This, he told himself, would never do. Not in front of the leering Ping Lu. I'm sure glad we found you, sir. Chuba came with me. Chuba was grinning at Uncle Charlie. We find you okay, Sahib Charlie. You in good shapes? I've been very well cared for, Uncle Charlie replied, stressing the word very. Ping Lu has seen to that. Uncle Charlie glanced at Ping Lu, then deliberately turned from him and bowed low to Tao Quang. A fleeting smile crossed the Ancient One's face. Quite a reunion, Ping Lu said, and surely a most happy one. It would be under different circumstances, Charles Keene said. Those circumstances can be altered to suit you and your nephew, Keene, Ping Lu said. He added, it is but a slight thing I ask you to do. Charles Keene shrugged his shoulders. Perhaps you would like to discuss it with your nephew, and I'm sure the Ancient One could advise you well. Ping Lu clapped his hands. The door through which Charles Keene had entered opened again. Across the room came a tall, white-robed man. Biff glanced at the man, then stared hard at him. It was Palung, the Chinese who had attempted to kidnap him at the Rangoon airport. Palung didn't even look at Biff. Biff's escape from him and his two knife-wielding thugs had undoubtedly caused Palung to lose face. Certainly Palung must have been disgraced in the eyes of his superior, Ping Lu. Show our guests to the large court. They have much to talk about. And be sure this time the young one doesn't get away. The expression on Ping Lu's face, the bark in his voice plainly said, That's an order. The two guards who had escorted Charles Keene into the room took their positions behind the three. A short, crisp sentence came from Ping Lu's lips. The ancient one rose from his chair and joined them. Palung led them from the room. The guards stayed close behind. The room they were taken to was large but sparsely furnished. There were two wooden chairs, plain but sturdy. Low benches, used for sleeping, lined the walls. The door closed behind the four, and they could hear a key turning in the door's lock. No one spoke for several moments. Then Biff went to the door to peer through its barred window. His stare was returned by a guard's expressionless face. Biff turned back to rejoin the group. All right, young man, Charles Keene said. Now suppose you just tell me how you happen to be here. I will, Uncle Charlie, but first, don't you think we'd better check to see if this room is bugged? You're right, Biff. Should have thought of that myself. There could be very well a microphone hidden in this room. I imagine Ping Lu would be most interested in what we'll be talking about. The inspection of the room took only a few minutes. The walls were bare. There were no light fixtures, no wiring. There was no place where a microphone could have been concealed. Guess we're safe from their ears, Uncle Charlie said. But why did they put us together? They've got some reason, I know. Biff nodded his head. He picked up one of the chairs and placed it near the bench, directly opposite the barred door. Chuba brought over the other one. Biff wanted to be as far away from the guard as possible. Plans had to be made. Biff didn't want them upset by any eavesdropper. The two Americans and the two Chinese huddled by the wall. They spoke in low tones. Biff quickly sketched in his experiences since leaving Indianapolis. Then he plied his uncle with questions. But what I don't understand, Uncle Charlie, is why they would want to capture me. I'm sure that blinky-eyed Chinese was spying on me from the moment I left Indianapolis, even before, according to your friend Ling Tang. You're right, Biff. And then I've told you how they tried to put the snatch on me at the airport, but why? I can't give you all the answers, Biff. I'm not sure of them myself. 
but I have a pretty good idea. Charles Keen paused to light a cigarette. I've been held here almost a month now, sort of lost track of the actual number of days. At first I thought they'd ship me off to Peking, the capital, but if I should agree to what Ping Lu wants me to, it would be a large feather in his cap. He'd become a big shot in the eyes of the big bosses in Peking. What does he want you to do? Biff asked. Just sign a paper. Sign a paper? Is that all? Biff asked, disbelief in his voice. Charlie Keen nodded his head. It would be quite a document, Biff. He hasn't let me read it, but from what he has said, I get the message. But why the paper, Uncle Charlie? That's what I'm not altogether sure of. I think Ping Lu believes. In fact, I know he does. He convinced that I came into China for a reason quite different from the real one. He believes the reason I gave him for daring to enter this forbidden country is merely a cover-up story for my real mission. What does he think you're doing here, Biff insisted. Charles Keane grinned. He has me marked as a big fat spy. An idea was buzzing around in Biff's mind. He thought he might have stumbled on why Ping Lu was spy-minded. But he'd tell Uncle Charlie about that later. He wanted to know some other things first. But how does this all connect up with me? Biff asked. I figure it this way, Biff. I'm sure if Palung had been able to kidnap you, that I started putting the pressure on me much sooner. When you escaped, it upset their plans and their timetable. They had to have you to force my hand. To sign the paper, you mean? That's right. They would have held you hostage. They would have promised to release you unharmed if I would agree to their demands. You wouldn't trust them to live up to their promise. No, but more than that, I didn't think they had you. Certain questions I asked led me to believe you were safe in Anheo. And now I turn up right in their own backyard. That's about it. I expect now they'll start turning up the heat. What do you figure is in this paper they want you to sign? I think, Biff, they want me to sign an official paper stating that I came here under the orders of the United States government to spy on the Chinese. Just what they think I was looking for, I don't know. Would such a document be so damaging? Very. It would embarrass our government and put an additional strain on relations that are strained enough already. In the eyes of the world, the Chinese could use such a paper to further discredit our country. They would aim the propaganda at those countries that are wavering in their opinion of the U.S. Just why did you come into China? I think I know, but I'd like to be sure, Biff said. It goes back to Indianapolis and my friendship with Ling Tang. I thought so. Ling Tang is a grandson of the ancient one here. Before I left to come out to Burma, Ling Tang asked me if I would help him and members of the House of Kwang if the occasion should arise. Naturally, I told my old friend that I would. Didn't know then, though, how much I was letting myself in for. The ancient one, although unable to understand English, pricked up his ears at the mention of Ling Tang and the House of Kwang. I've been out here about three months when I got a letter from Tang telling me one of his brothers was going to try to escape from China. He was going to try to cross into Burma. He would seek me out, identifying himself with the ring which bears the seal of the House of Kwang. Like the ring that came through my window. That's right, Biff. Tang's brother did get out. He gave me the ring. I, in turn, sent it on to Tang in the States. Whenever another escape was about to take place, the ring was to be sent me to alert me of the fact. A lot safer than putting such information in writing. Then it was Ling Tang himself who got the ring to me so mysteriously, Biff said. Yes, you were to bring that ring to me, and then I would know that another Quang was on the way out. But why didn't you wait, Biff asked, wait until I got here with the ring? I couldn't. There's an underground network that passes information along. From it, I learned that the Ancient One had finally been persuaded to seek haven and peace in the outside world. I also learned that he was in grave danger of being made a prisoner. 
If this happened, then all members of the House of Kwang would have to obey the orders of the Chinese Red Government. The government believes that the House of Kwang has hidden valuables worth millions of dollars. If they took the Ancient One prisoner, the family would be forced to tell where these valuables are or never see the head of their family again. And you know how the Chinese worship and revere the head of the house. Chuba sat silent, wide-eyed, as Charles Keane told his story. It was foolish of me, I guess, but when I heard they were about to move in on the ancient one, I decided on a gamble. I sent word back that I was flying in. They were to have the ancient one ready. I'd pick him up and come out. I had the whole thing figured out. Wouldn't take more than five hours in and out. I also figured on the element of surprise. No one would be expecting such a bold move. And what happened? Everything got fouled up. My starboard motor conked out, carburetor iced up in the rarefied atmosphere, couldn't maintain flying speed and had to make a fourth landing. Banged the plane up so I couldn't take off again. And then just as I was making a signal to Unhayo, they grabbed me. That was you then. Your signal came the first morning I was in Unhayo. So part of it did get through. I hoped it had. Charlie continued his story. I was brought here, and the next day they brought in the Ancient One. The conversation was cut short by the sound of the key turning in the door. It swung open, and a Chinese entered bringing food. Biff hadn't realised how much time had passed, but now he realised he was ravenously hungry. As the servant placed the food on one of the benches, the guard stood just inside the door, his gun covering the prisoners. Nothing was said as they ate. All were famished. Biff raised his plate to scrape up the last few grains of rice. As he did so, his eye was caught by a small, square piece of thin paper stuck on the bottom of the plate. He removed the paper and once more saw the symbol K, the seal of the House of Quang. Without a word, Biff handed it to the Ancient One. The old man looked at it. Now it was his time to talk, as the Americans and Chuba listened. End of chapter 19「Twenty of the Mystery of the Chinese Ring by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Muscles, Muscles in Muscles checked his watch for the tenth time in the past five minutes. He was growing more and more impatient. The minute hand showed it to be ten minutes past four o'clock. Twenty minutes remained before Biff's four-hour deadline would run out. The powerful mechanic had returned to the spring. He kept his eyes turned in the direction of the path taken by Chan Li, Biff and Chuba. He kept them turned that way except for the times he glared at the crystal of his watch. There was no sign of anyone. He could see the path at several spots. He had watched closely as long as he could when the party of three had left. Since their departure, he had seen no one. They could be back by now, he said to himself. Plenty of time to get there and back. Impatiently, he strode up and down. Deep within him, Muscles knew that he really wasn't expecting them to return. His doubts, his fears had grown as the minutes became hours. He pounded his fist into the palm of his other hand. He wanted action. He was a man of action. This waiting, he told himself, was strictly for the birds. At 4.25, Muscles could stand it no longer. He started for the path. If Biff, Chubbett, Charlie Keene and their guide were returning, he'd meet them on the way. Muscles went along the path at a dog trot. Without realising, he broke into a run. He checked himself when he came to the path's sharp left turn and the steep rise to the crumbling stone wall. Now he was certain that Chan Li had led his friends into a trap. It was nearly 5.30, an hour over the deadline. The path by the wall, Muscles noticed, ran each way. Which way to turn, left or right? His decision was made for him by a sound. Muscles crouched low, just off the path, out of sight. He could plainly hear someone coming toward him. He stared through a small opening in the thick bush he was using as cover. His muscles tensed. He was ready to spring like a tiger. 
A figure suddenly came into view. It was Chan Li. With a snarl, muscles sprang. He jumped on the back of the Chinese. His weight hurled the slighter man to the ground. Like a cat, muscles leapt up. He snatched Chan's right arm, twisted it until Chan was face down on the ground. Muscles, keeping pressure on the arm, plunked himself down on Chan's back, increasing pressure on the arm until Chan gasped in pain. Muscles rasped out, OK, let's have it and fast. Where are the boys? Chan didn't answer. You're going to be a one-armed Chinese if you don't talk. Muscles cupped his free hand on the back of Chan's head. He ground the man's face in the dirt. Talk. The pain was bad enough, but the humiliation of having his face ground into the dirt, of losing face literally, was more than Chan could stand. I talk, he said. Muscles released the pressure. He stood up. Now get up, you dog. Get up and tell me what happened. I had to do it. I had to lead the boys to Ping Lu. If I don't, he'd do great harm to my family. Ping Lu, who's he? Member of the Quang tribe? No, he big boss in this territory. So you turn traitor to your own. Where are the boys? In big house, not far from here. Let's get going then. Show me the way. Chan Li seemed to shrink in size at Muscle's words. Oh no, no, never. They kill me. They kill you if we go back. Many guards, all armed. Muscles thought fast. Charles Keen is there too. Chan nodded his head. Now listen, you double-crosser. I don't trust you, but I've got to. Do you know any members of the Quang family who are opposed to this Ping Lu you mentioned? Oh yes, are many round here? All right. Now get this and get it straight. You're going to take me to one of them. And if you try to cross me, you'll die along with me. I can knock you off with one blow. Muscles held a clenched fist to Chan's face. He twisted it on the Chinese's nose. I'll be this close to you all the time. And believe me, I'll get you before anyone gets me. Understand? I understand. Chan Li won't try double cross. OK, let's get going then, and on the double. The Ancient One took the slip of paper from Biff. He looked at it carefully, then nodded his head. He turned to Chuba and spoke softly, swiftly. After a few moments, he stopped and indicated with a nod toward Biff and Charles Keene that Chuba was to interpret. The Ancient One says there is great hope for escape. This piece of paper comes from one of his grandsons. He works in the kitchen. It is not known by the officials here that this cook is member of the House of Quang. He was placed here to spy on Ping Lu, to try to find out plans, to warn when danger threatens Quang House people. The Ancient One resumed his speaking. He says that paper with K on it is signal. Either tonight, when clock makes twelve strikes, or tomorrow night at the same time, attempt will be made to rescue him and us. How, Chuba? Ask him how, Biff said. As Chuba spoke, the Ancient One shook his head. Does not know exact plans. His grandson will try to be servant who comes for Trey. He will tell us plan. Biff looked at his uncle. Guess there's nothing we can do but wait. Uncle Charlie agreed. But things look good. When members of the House of Quang act, they're usually successful. Then how in the world did they ever let the Ancient One get captured in the first place, Biff asked. I think the Ancient One himself had something to do with that. He doesn't really want to leave his homeland. He is old, and like all Chinese, he wants his final resting place to be in the earth of his native land. I've heard that was true. Look, Uncle Charlie, I think I may have an idea as to why Ping Lu is so desperate for you to sign that paper. Give out, Biff, give out. Well, I'm not sure, of course, but on our way to Jaraminka, we ran into something very strange. Was much big workings, Chuba cut in. Many, many more big machines than when camp was cleared at Unheo. Tell me more, Biff. Biff described the activity they had discovered behind the wire fence. He told his uncle of the immensity of the project, of the furious pace at which the men worked, of the bulldozers, the cranes, the steam shovels. And there's an airstrip already completed. It was loaded with planes. You have an idea what it might be? 
Charles Keene thought a few moments before replying. Only a slight idea from what you've told me, Biff. I'd have to see the place. Maybe you can take a look on our way back. If we ever get out of here, his uncle said soberly. We'll get out, Biff said spiritedly. Hope you're right, Biff. You know, putting two and two together, the build-up of the army in this area, and what you've described, it could be that Ping Lu thinks my real reason for coming in was to get information on the huge construction job. That's what I thought, Uncle Charlie. There was a noise at the door. All four raised expectant, hopeful eyes. Their expression of hope changed to one of despair. The same servant who had brought the meal came into the room to remove the tray piled with dishes. What had happened to the Ancient One's grandson? End of chapter 20